I wonder, can someone help me with the mics? Yeah, thanks, Natalie. Maybe you want to cover that side. What, uh, so what do people think? Are, they, are these community cases? Are they oyster related? How do you tell? How do you differentiate the two? Ideas? Martian. I think in our table that we discussed that um, there's a few ways that, again, that the social media is one. And number two, maybe Natalie can get all the samples and do the whole genome sequence and see where it is coming from. <laughs> Thanks, Marshad. <laughs> so you're suggesting genotyping the human specimens. Yep. To see if they're similar to the ones from the Tofino outbreak or more similar to the strains that are circulating in the community. Yeah. And certainly that's one thing that we did uh, plan to do, but it takes time. So right then and there, where there, is there other information that can be used to uh, differentiate the two? Hi. Um, I guess we were also thinking um, from the oyster harvest sites, if there's additional testing done and make sure that you collect enough that you could do genotyping and compare them. Looking at genotypes and looking, first of all, if they're positive, right? Um, and then comparing genotypes. Great. Other ideas? Does anybody think that the cases can reveal information? Um, we discussed a case control study, or if you guys have background rates to do some binomial probability analysis to see um, whether or not p the cases are consuming more oysters than controls or against the background could be at least a start. And we do, we do have population-based data on the proportion of the, of the healthy population that eats oysters in a seven-day period, and it's one or two percent. And here we have a hundred percent. So in terms of just there's a selection bias here, potentially people know about the outbreak, so they eat oysters and they get sick and so then they contact healthcare providers. But you actually never, sorry, you didn't provide us with data on how you decided to close just two oyster farms. I mean, it's quite possible that there's much more extensive contamination of oyster farms that you didn't uncover initially. Good thinking, yeah. Charmaine, did you want to comment on that? So, so, yeah, sorry if I wasn't clear on that. So the, the, the initial farm that was closed was based on the shellfish tags, because it identifies the site that it came from, and there was an overwhelming number of oysters from that particular site. So it was based on tags. Any other thoughts to help clarify this conundrum? There were other thoughts. When I walked around, there was another thought that came up, which was around um, looking for commonalities. So uh, looking for commonalities between these cases, were they, did they all go to the same restaurant? Um, did they all eat the same kind of oyster? Does the oysters do the oysters trace back to a common site or a site that was known to be contaminated? And also, um, were people, could people have gotten ill from um, contact with known sources of norovirus, another ill person in their household, or through their workplace. Um, and so those are all things that we did look for, um, but it wasn't clear, it didn't become clear uh, until we started accumulating more cases. And so three weeks later, we had now 27 clusters of illnesses reported from Vancouver Island, Vancouver Coastal Health, and Fraser Health Authorities. So three regions, so much more widespread illness. All of these people had consumed oysters. There were 16 restaurants and seven stores involved. And we now had positives for norovirus, as you suggested. Eight of the human uh, cases were lab confirmed as norovirus genogroup 1 or genogroup 1 and 2. And we now finally had an oyster that was positive for norovirus G1, so genogroup 1. So the, the, the fact that there was more widespread, these are communities that did not, had not necessarily had as much media attention, in fact, 
little to no media attention around the Tofino outbreak. We're also starting to report cases. And we now had a positive norovirus sample. And in addition, and I didn't present it here, there were no other common sources of illness. And um, these cases did not have contact with other ill people. So the evidence was now much stronger that the oysters were the source of illness. So at this point, we did proceed with public communication to advise British Columbians about the risk of consuming raw oysters during this norovirus season. Um, and that uh, if possible, if they wanted to consume uh, nor uh, oysters, if they wanted to consume norovirus, to please cook their oysters <laughs> uh, um, to, um, to 90 degrees for 90 seconds, which if, if any of you do, do cook oysters to that, uh, to that extent, you probably won't want to eat them. Um, so it was, it was a difficult message to provide, but our, 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 um, the philosophy here was to inform the consumer for them to make informed decisions. Now, as this was going on, um, Alberta and Ontario also reported to us that they were starting to see cases of norovirus infection associated with the consumption of BC oysters. And by January 30th, there was a national outbreak investigation that was launched. This was led by the Public Health Agency of Canada and included, among others, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the Environment and Climate Change Canada, as well as obviously BC, Alberta, and Ontario Ministries of Health, BC CDC, the Health Authorities, and the Ministries of Agriculture. By the end of the outbreak, which extended from um, December 6th to March 26th, we had a 331 illnesses, or 145 clusters of illness. Um, uh, I can't remember now the proportion that were tested positive for norovirus, but sort of around the 10% mark tested positive for norovirus. And the majority of the cases occurred in British Columbia residents, but you can see there are about 30 uh, to 40 cases in, um, in Alberta and Ontario as well. Using the, the shellfish-related uh, illness investigation that I showed to you at the beginning, uh, tags were collected at the premises where the oysters were purchased or consumed and identified multiple shellfish farms uh, from which these oysters came in four distinct areas. So on the east coast of Vancouver Island, uh, around uh, the Tofino area, where uh, there was one of the one closure did occur uh, following the Tofino outbreak, there were seven farms that were implicated uh, during the second wave of the outbreak. There were right here in Baines Sound, there were 20 farms implicated in the uh, national outbreak. Um, and this is the largest growing area for oysters uh, that are consumed on the, on the half shell, so raw, raw oysters. Uh, and so it's not surprising to see a number of farms implicated there. So, oops, sorry. Uh, 14 farms were uh, implicated in human illness in and around Cortez Island and one farm in the Lund area. So what you can see here is a large number of farms, uh, very D disparate locations uh, that may have been contaminated and may have led to human illness. So, I th and with, when looking, when you guys had the discussion over the last question, I think a lot of people mentioned that genotyping, I know Morsha threw me under the bus there, saying that I should be the one genotyping everything, um, <laughs> which, um, which is how it works. Um, so genotyping really did help in this outbreak investigation. And one of the things I really wanted to point out here is that there is, um, we do genotyping for a representative sample from every outbreak that happens in British Columbia. And we've been doing this since, oh, the late, to, mid to late 2000s. Um, and what you'll see here that there, that G, as I mentioned before, G1 and G2 are the most predominant human, the human types of norovirus. And if we were to de dig a little bit deeper, of the outbreaks that happen in British Columbia up until recently, the majority were caused by a strain called G24. Right, you can see it right there. And that was considered an epidemic strain. And what was happening in, the, uh, in British Columbia and across the world was that we'd have these epidemic re-emergences of new types of G24. And every time they would re-emerge, we'd have these peak norovirus seasons. And then it would sort of dissipate. But, at the but what we do know is that G24 is the most common type of norovirus that we see in the community outbreaks. Um, and it represents, you know, it, in December, January, in the peak norovirus season, it represents probably about 70% of the norovirus cases in the province. 
Um, that pattern is shifting a little bit now, and we are seeing that shift internationally, but really the key is that G24 Sydney or G24 New Orleans is what we expect the majority of our cases to be during, um, during the fall season. Um, here's a summary of all the different cases that I, of British Columbia samples from the first outbreak as well as the second outbreak, or some people may consider it one big outbreak. And the total number of clinical submissions from the 300 and some reported cases, and that includes the Ontario and Alberta cases, um, but we had about 20 clinical samples. It is really, really, really hard to compel someone to poop in a jar. Um, <laughs> It's, and, um, and so we had the difficulties, and so we, we really relied heavily on the people who were willing to do that. And if you ever do have gastro and you're part of an outbreak, I highly recommend that you poop in the jar. It'll help public health. Um, but what I wanted to point out is a few key things. And the first thing is that in the very beginning, in the Tofino outbreak, there was two, two genotypes, and there were G1s. And as Teresa mentioned in the very beginning, that's pretty common for foodborne outbreaks, and particularly oyster outbreaks, because G1s bind really, really nicely to oysters. The second thing is that we know that G1 survive a little bit better in the environment than G2. This is some anecdotal evidence, but if you look in marine waters, fresh water, on foods, you're more likely to find G1s than G2s. And so the hypothesis is that G2s are really good pathogens. They replicate at a really high rate and that a host will have a lot more in their stool, but they're more environmentally labile. They don't do as well in the environment. Um, but G1s, they sh they're shed at lower amounts in, in patients but they're good at surviving in the environment, and you see them in much higher proportions in wastewater treatment plants, for example, than you would at G2, even though G2 is what's causing the majority of outbreaks in the community. So that's the first thing I wanted to point out. At the very beginning of the outbreak, we saw G1 and G2, um, but, and the other thing I wanted to point out is this, this G24, our most common strain that we have in British Columbia and across Canada, we never saw it once in any of these oyster cases. Um, but we did see a number of outbreaks in the community. It still was our predominant strain in the community. So what, what I'm really pointing out is that there are some commonalities. There are some strains we saw in the oyster cases as well as in the community. But for the most part, we did see the striation where we had some genotypes that were only found in oyster cases and some that were only found in the community. And so there, we did know that there was a, something different happening here than just community cases is the first point. And the second point, we were surprised by the diversity of genotypes that we detected amongst the oyster cases. Had this been a single point source pollution event, you would expect to see a single genotype. But we see lots of genotypes. You see lots of different genotypes. You see lots of different farms affected geographically. This was a very I guess diverse or geographically, a huge range of different things happening during this outbreak. And that's something to think about as we go through the case study. Thank you. So Jackie, you couldn't be with us today. She is from the CFIA and she provided these uh, two slides, which I'll walk us through. So what does CFIA do when uh, we provide this information to them that pinpoints a potential food as a source of an outbreak? So first off, there's always a time lag between consumption and the CFIA receiving the report of illness. For norovirus, this is between four and 21 days. Most illnesses are multi-source. And this is an important point, meaning there are multiple shellfish tags for any given illness rep report. And this can be due to multiple reasons, including the fact that people usually eat or often eat more than one type of oyster when they're eating oysters, or it may be because of lack of precise record keeping at the, at the, at the food uh, service establishment. Second, the CFIA investigators typically contact the implicated processor the same day that the illness report is made, and the inspector determines what kind of follow-up may be required with the processor, an on-site investigation or a documentation review. Point three, uh, an on-site follow-up includes an inspection of the facility, so these are the, the seafood uh, or, or shellfish processors, to determine if there are any sanitation issues or obvious non-compliant issues. They review control plans, the pro processing records, complaint records, and product testing records. They interview employees, they review employee training records, and employee illness records. And the fourth point is that each illness report is assigned a unique identifier, so it's easy to reference. And any non-compliances found during the investigation are documented in this record. And the CFIA documents illness investigation has a protocol uh, that they follow for each of these identified issues. It's called the Food Investigation Response Manual, and it's available online. It describes the investigation of food safety and non-food safety issues 
and uh, outlines risk management strategies as well as how rate recalls should be done. Um, if the processor, if there's no problem with the processor, then the attention is focused on the shellfish farms. And for this norovirus outbreak, investigation at the farms were a joint effort between the CFIA and Environment and Climate Change Canada. Farms are typically investigated when there's no evidence that the source of contamination is at the processing level. So based on, uh, on the investigation at the processor and then the investigation on site at several farms, as well as oyster testing that were uh, from oysters that were collected at these farms, there was a closure during the outbreaks of 13 shellfish farms. Two of them were closed um, related to the Tofino outbreak, as was previously mentioned, and the remaining were related to the second uh, wave of the outbreak. Closures covered a large geographic area involving several shellfish harvest locations on the west and east coasts of Vancouver Island. The CFIA programs and policy branch developed interim situational guidance that was used to inform this, these closures. There was no pre-existing uh, guidelines for norovirus closures, and so uh, there was interim guidelines developed for closure and reopening of the farms, uh, which also needed guidance. And this included a number of criteria, including the sampling results um, and the uh, epidemiological assessments, as well as other data like water temperature. And so if this is mapped, and thanks to Mika Fraser for most of the maps in these presentations, um, you'll see here the location of the closures correspond to the four areas we showed to you earlier. Now, um, 13 farms were closed, many more farms were implicated in illness, but the evidence necessary to close a farm um, is obviously much more strict than just being implicated in an illness. And, uh, and so if a, a farm was positive for norovirus and or multiple illnesses traced back to that same farm, that gave more uh, weight to the decision to close a farm. Lorraine. So, Eleni was mentioning a working group that we started. Um, it actually was started as the outbreak was ongoing. In January and February, we had six or seven what we called intersectorial meetings with both the regulators, um, public health, and industry. And uh, that that um, we transformed that into this working group because uh, between we didn't have enough meetings to go to you know we had two or three a week we had the OICC we had the local public health we had the intersectorial and at each meeting we discussed how many were ill and what areas and what were the farms implicated but we weren't really getting to the why was it I mean the industry's perspective was why me <laughs> but but anyway, so we formed this working group uh, at No Environmental Transmission of uh, Oysters into Norovirus, and really we wanted to find out, well, what is the root cause of, of this outbreak? And in these boxes here, it shows you all the various activities. Um, there's a line showing that it's linear, but this was all ongoing at the same time. We consulted many different experts. Um, our, our first speaker was uh, someone that Natalie recommended, Dr. Curtis Suttle, who's a marine virologist from UBC. We consul consulted earth ocean sciences experts from UBC as well, Greg West and climate, and Rich Paulowitz, who's a current specialist. And what we were trying to do as a group, and the group included uh, all those same players again, uh, especially industry, but also public health and regulators, especially Envi Environment Climate Change Canada and Department of Fisheries and Oceans and all those people. Uh, we really wanted to find out what was causing all the shellfish farms to be contaminated with norovirus. Oh, I went the wrong way. So I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes on these working group hypotheses because your, your question comes right after this. We actually, the first thing we did on that slide, uh, the, the slide that I just showed you is we did a survey of all of the people, all the stakeholders in our working group to ask them, well, what are our working hypotheses for this outbreak? What are our plausible hypotheses? And we actually came up with 20, but we've condensed them down here into 10 and um, we really, we really wanted to see what were people's opinions on what the most plausible hypotheses for this outbreak were. Was it sewage outfalls near shellfish farms? But that wouldn't have explained all of the disparate farms, right? We were thinking about local wastewater treatment plants or maybe multiple wastewater treatment plants. I mean, Vancouver 
is a big city, there's, there's a lot of poop that comes out of Vancouver. Um, we were kind of thinking, of, could there have been a single discharge event? And I have a slide later on that, that shows, you know, Victoria. Is there anyone here from the capital from Victoria? They don't, they don't even have primary treatment, you know, so they, <laughs> they put out a lot of poop. And, and uh, they actually did have a, a breach. So we were thinking, we were, we were really interested in ocean currents. Maybe we could have had a single event that explained everything. Uh, and we were worried about perhaps norovirus uh, can reside in sediments and, and over winter. And maybe during winter storms, it gets stirred up and travels around. So of these 10 hypotheses, we have the sewage outfall, local multiple waste water treatment plants. We have boats and vessels. In 2004, when we had this outbreak, cruise ships were blamed, but we don't have cruise ships in the winter time. But we do have commercial uh, fishing that goes on. And, and as you know, um, they don't always contain their waste on board. Uh, we, we are worried about wildlife. Wet storage contamination is where um, shellfish once they've either been harvested, they can go into large processing facilities where the water could be contaminated, or sometimes they're actually relayed from one site to another site. So we're worried that perhaps we had some contamination there. Uh, ill shellfish farm workers, like we had in, in 2010, um, that was, a, we called that a self-admitted overboard discharge event. <laughs> And uh, since, since uh, I was part of that outbreak, those were Effingham Inlet oysters. So the other thing we used to say it was don't eat the effing oysters. <laughs> <laughs> we were worried about single point land runoff and discharge was another one or, or I don't know, other, other unexplained events. So your next question, what, what was the smoking gun? How do you figure that out? What do you think? was the most plausible hypothesis for why norovirus uh, was transmitted somehow to oysters in these shellfish farms. So, five minutes.